Born and raised in Socrates, New York, in the Hudson Valley. One of ten children. Right after the Depression. So that paints the picture. Things were tough. Strong father and mother set our compasses for life in various ways. Daddy focused on instilling in us a, a need to work and work hard and not be ever ashamed of having to work hard. Mother instilled a spiritual dimension in all of us. And together they both instilled and repeated the need to serve. New York native Roger Donlan joined the Air Force in 1953. After serving for nearly two years, Donlan earned admission into the military academy at West Point. Just two years later, he decided to leave the program, but soon after, he re-enlisted, went through officer candidate school, and eventually qualified for the U.S. Army Special Forces. He was sent to Vietnam in 1964. In our particular case, we were to be assigned in the mountains in I Corps to a camp called Nam Dong. We would be the fourth Special Forces team in there on a six-month rotational basis. There had been no significant actions in that area. It was in a somewhat strategic location because we were sitting astride one of the infiltration routes from the Ho Chi Minh Trail out of Laos. So we arrived in country with a mission to train, advise, and assist the, the Vietnamese in areas that they needed. There were many things building up to, to the battles. There, we had some indications that there was things a brew. We had a, had a shootout in the camp a few days before. And as we analyzed later, it was instigated by one of the people that we were training and uh, who was a Viet Cong sympathizer, infiltrator. The term that we hear today more often used was sleeper. We felt we had maybe 19. It so happened that particular night on 6 July, 64, I was on guard duty and about to check off. And all hell broke loose. The first rounds came in. We're so positioned and we so trained to, from a dead sleep to get to positions, specifically mortar positions, within our inner perimeter. Well, we got to those positions, and to make a long story short, uh, when we were attacked, there were more like 100 infiltrators, and their instructions were, and they had them all the time, that they would, uh, when the battle started, they would strip off their outer garments, and they would be, in essence, the same uniform of the penetrating infiltrators and sappers, which was brightly colored loincloths, and their survivability. But when they stripped that off, then their instruction was to either break the neck or slit the throat of the person next to them. So the 300 that we were training was nearly down to, at best, 100. Then you get the horrible news that you hope you'd never hear from your medic that you're starting to take casualties. And in our case, one of the first was one of our youngest, John Houston. I paused, I, mentally at least, to say, God, why John, why not me? Because as I found out in the hospital a week or so later that I was the only one that John had had the opportunity to share the contents of the letter that he received from Alice, that they were soon to be proud parents of twins. Well, that's almost powerful enough to stop you in your tracks, but fortunately, I was able to view it as a need for me to dig deeper, not just to perform my own, but to perform and fill the void that John's absence created. Donlan swiftly marshaled his forces, 
directing defense operations amidst a barrage of mortar shells, falling grenades, and heavy gunfire. Over a PA set, were the words clearly in English and then in Vietnamese. Lay down your weapons, we just want the Americans. But it was a powerful weapon used against us because the sympathizers they had, and I think possibly others, had stopped firing. So we had to encourage them to re-engage the enemy. They took some doing, during which time I got wounded a couple more times. It was a, a situation where some of the sappers, infiltrators, large rucks of demolitions were crawling towards the, the main gate of our camp. And I spotted them, and I moved toward them to try to get a beat on them. They moved up towards and got positioned below the main gate. And instinctively, through your training, you think instantly or just momentarily what's your most effective firing position with a small rifle. And I, for one reason or another, went right into a kneeling position, took a bead on one of the sappers, pulled the trigger and there was no ammunition. I yelled to my mortar pit not far away and they knew what kind of weapon I had and they were throwing it out and I was trying to load it. But it was still in a cardboard and container so I had to pull a few rounds out, load it, and then get three rounds and dispatch the, the sappers and they never got a chance to blow that main gate. Uh, the enemy struck us with a, a force of eight, nine hundred. And we were down to dependable warriors, what we had in the inner perimeter, which is at best 75. But uh, we agreed amongst ourselves that we would never surrender. We would die and go down fighting. So we had that commitment to each other. Everybody knew that. And I think that was one of the combat multipliers that kept us going. For five hours, Donlan coordinated his unit's defensive operations despite his critical physical condition from repeated injuries. He moved from position to position, carrying needed weapons and administering first aid and encouragement to the wounded. His bravery and leadership resulted in the successful defense of the camp. I was home on leave, and thanks for Thanksgiving in 1964. And the phone rang and said they wanted you at the White House and at noon on the 5th of December. Didn't quite believe them. Being a Medal of Honor recipient is something that you would never, never even dream of. There was a great sense of comfort, too, knowing that you're now a member of the Congressional Medal of Honor Society, a band of brothers that you never hear the word hate amongst them. You killed the enemy because of the love you had for the man next to you. And the smaller your team, that love is, is deeper than the man next to you because you know his whole family. You knew him that well. You knew their lives. You knew how their careers had developed. You knew their potholes in their lives. You knew how brave they, they were just getting where they are. So the most powerful emotion on on Earth is, is love. And we have to remind ourselves that time and time again and, and convey that to the next generation. <laughs>